Good afternoon and welcome to our Monticello live stream. Today we're featuring Bill Barker as Thomas Jefferson talking about a day in the life of Jefferson. Let us know where you're joining from and please put your questions in the comments. Oh, citizens, <laughs> my pleasure, I beg your pardon. I was just um, entering uh, some more minutia uh, here into my memorandum book. Uh, I try to keep as uh, distinct and select uh, accounts and, and records as possible. Uh, it reminds me of where I've been and it helps me understand better where I am and how to hold on to my accounts uh, as I proceed uh, into the, well, into the future as we all must endeavor to do. And uh, yes, you've found me here very attentive to the timing of how long I might spend on these uh, records and the recording. And I suppose that leads us into the subject of our uh, conversation here today, how I spend my day, how I apportion, if you will, uh, the timing of my day. And I'm more than happy to discuss that with you. And Ms. Boyle is here to uh, help us, uh, well, with your questions and curiosities. So, uh, if you will, let us begin with our first question. Well, let's jump right in then. Um, so how does an average day here at Monticello begin for you? Well, it begins for me uh, rising before the sun or rising with the sun, however you might refer to it. I prefer that the sun never catches me in bed. And therefore, I have already created my time before uh, the proper daylight begins. Now, I usually tend first to take the temperature. Uh, I have a thermometer, I even have a traveling thermometer, so that when I travel great distances, uh, such as the five delightful years in La Belle France, I have a portable thermometer that I brought with me. Uh, then while here at Monticello, I also record the direction of the winds. Uh, I see that, of course, because of a weather vane on top of the house that uh, provides with its attachment uh, to a little dial, uh, the direction of the winds, which I recall. And then, uh, if you will, I set about uh, to soak my feet in ice cold water. There are days when I prefer to soak my feet in a pail of ice cold water first before I record the temperature or record uh, the direction of the winds. Now, many people wonder why, and when they visited uh, my, um, my bed chamber, uh, which always intrigues me that great numbers do pass through my sanctum sanctorum of my writing room and my library and my bed chamber. Well, my point, when they visit the bed chamber, many will see the, um, well, the outline, if you will, in a, in a circle uh, on the floor. In, on the wood, in the floor. And yes, that's where usually the pail of cold water is placed in which I soak my feet. Now, I don't wish to avoid the, the, the question as to why. It is simply because I believe it prevents the common cold. Now, I learned that when I was very young and I have discovered throughout all of the years that I can go uh, six years at a time uh, without a cold. So there must be uh, some common sense in it. I've often said that I learned it from Mr. George Wythe when I was reading law under him uh, for three years in Williamsburg. Uh, Mr. Wythe uh, would go even further than that. Uh, Mr. Wythe would go out of doors early in the morning in the all together, uh, draw a pail of cold water out of the well, and then douse himself entirely in the cold weather. So that, that sound we would hear early in the morning in Williamsburg was not the rooster. And remember too, Dr. Franklin, Benjamin Franklin would take air baths. He would go out of doors on a breezy day in the all together and, uh, and take air baths. So soaking my feet in ice cold water is a daily prescription for me. Uh, then I tend to correspondence. I try to get out of the way uh, sometimes 10 or 12 letters. And if I get overly hungry, well, then I have a biscuit box. And uh, there I will help myself to a biscuit. And I always have coffee. I consider coffee the drink of the civilized world. Mind you, I gave up tea many, many years ago. 
uh, I then like to attend to a breakfast uh, with my family later. So that's how I commence uh, each day, no matter the temperature, no matter the time of the year. So how do you think your routines in adulthood compared to those of your youth at Shadwell, Tuckahoe, or William and Mary? Well, I would reckon that to each their own, but for me, as I've gotten older, uh, my routine is a bit more relaxed, relaxed for me, because when I was a young boy, uh, having been born and grown up at Shadwell, I was the eldest son, the eldest son in a family eventually of 10 children. So much was expected of me. And yes, of course, I had daily chores. So though it might not be taking the temperature, though it might not be uh, recording the direction of the winds, uh, I would still have to be out indulging my chores uh, upon the farm. That might be bringing in firewood, that might be bringing in pails of water from the well, uh, that might be uh, in the cultivation of the garden and in kind. And remember too, as a young boy, I was there in the midst of my chores expected of me with the other young children who, as you well may understand, were enslaved uh, as different from me. So in many an instance growing up, um, all of us were at times working together uh, as young children. So uh, having the opportunity to try and get my studies in during all of that was as well a, a great labor. And uh, I tried when I was a young boy, even when my family was living at Tuckahoe Plantation. Mind you, my father moved our family there when my mother's cousin, William Randolph of Tuckahoe, passed away. So our uh, father then oversaw the rearing of the Randolph children as he did our own family. So when I was a young boy at Tuckahoe, it was none the, uh, different in helping uh, in the chores around the, the plantation as a tucko, and this in the midst then of beginning my schooling, uh, my schooling at the Latin school that was conducted there at Tuckahoe. Now, when we returned home, again, schooling continued on uh, as at Shadwell, I would often go up to the Reverend James Morris Classical Academy, and they attend to my lessons. Now, I will not say that I, I traveled by horseback on a phaeton every single day, and traveling from Shadwell to, uh, to Castle Hill. Castle Hill was where the Reverend Morris Classical Academy was conducted. I actually lived there for a time, uh, up in the garret of the schoolhouse itself. And as far as I know, uh, even now, uh, while I'm approaching my uh, dotage here at Monticello, that schoolhouse is still standing uh, at, uh, at Castle Hill. Uh, and then, of course, there was the opportunity for me to go to William & Mary, and that was an entirely different scenario of how I began my day and, uh, and engaged it entirely. So expanding out even further, in your 40 years of public service, you lived in many different places, including Philadelphia, Williamsburg, New York, and even Paris, France. Mm -hmm. How did your life and customs change between these places? Well, first and foremost, no matter where I have resided throughout my entire life, uh, whether it be uh, in the various cities throughout the ancient kingdoms of Europe, uh, whether it be when our government was in New York for those several months in the spring of 1790, or when our government was in Philadelphia for a good 10 years before we moved, removed our federal government to Washington City, I continue, I continue to rise with the sun. I continue to take the temperature, to take the direction of the winds, if I can ascertain that. I continue to tend directly to my correspondence to get as much of that out of the way. And in the particular offices that I have occupied, for instance, in Paris, as Minister Plenipotentiaire, that is representing our entire government, pleni meaning all, potentiary meaning powers, I held all the powers of our government, legislative, judicial, and executive. So I had to attend to my administrations early as well. And to get all of that out of the way, uh, so I could then uh, engage the rest of the day as I should choose. So I began that habit and custom young. I, I tried when I was a student at William & Mary, uh, though obligated to attend to classes, uh, to get all of my schoolwork and homework uh, out of the way so I could enjoy the rest of the day to purchase books from the bookstall across the street from the old Royal College of William and Mary to engage reading what I wanted to read. 
So I have tried, no matter where I've lived, uh, to maintain that custom and also to dine lightly as best as possible. Uh, because most of my administrations, no matter where I have lived, uh, have been sedentary. And so that's why, though I engage the exercise of my mind, I still need time to exercise my body. So with that in mind, being more sedentary in my daily constitution, I try to dine lightly. So that is part of my daily regimen as well, no matter where I live. Now, I must say this, there's a great difference between being born and growing up on a farm uh, such as Shadwell, uh, attending to the inheritance of my father's freeholdings uh, when I was but 14 years old. That's how old I was when he passed away in 1757. Uh, of course, I did not come immediately into the management of all of the five farms that I would inherit. That would occur later when I reached my majority at 21 years in 1764. But what a difference growing up and attending to the management of a farm and plantation as contrasted with living in a city such as Paris, living in a city such as London, where I resided for a few months living in a city such as New York, again for a few months, or Philadelphia, or in the president's house in Washington City. I will say of all of the aforementioned cities and urban markets, if you will, Paris was by far the most engaging. I looked forward at the beginning of the day to enjoy the evening at the theater, uh, to enjoy uh, uh, the salons that were offered, uh, not only in the company of the ladies, but also in the company of the gentlemen of visiting the Adams when they resided in Otoy, visiting with the Marquis de Lafayette and, and his lady, Adrian. Uh, so Paris, with all of its, its beauty, its art, its uh, diversity in architecture, in all of the salons, the enlightenment of conversation, uh, proved throughout my entire life uh, to provide more activities one could attend to during the day and the evening than I've known in my entire life besides. So now let's come full circle and get back to Monticello. Now that you're finally at home, um, no longer with the cares of public office, what is your usual daily regimen throughout the day here at Monticello? Mm. Well, as I said, I try to maintain uh, the, the steady and consistent regimen uh, before the sun even rises and through the rising of the sun. Uh, after breakfast, uh, I usually then tend to conversations with my family, uh, still around the breakfast table. Uh, I then try to ride out uh, amongst my native fields and, and through the woods to investigate the progress, always interested in the progress that is being made uh, in the gardens, in the fields, uh, in the certain attentions along Mulberry Road, uh, there at the Nailery. Uh, they at the joinery, uh, they at the weaver's cottage. I try to inspect as best I can to, to speak with personally as many of the overseers upon our, our five farms in this immediate area. So I, I do endeavor to maintain that uh, well before uh, then the dinner hour. The dinner hour is usually at about three, half past three, sometimes four, depending upon the number of guests that we are welcoming here. At, at Monticello. And of course, the regiment, as far as attendance to dinner, is maintained by the dinner bell. Uh, we ring the dinner bell uh, twice. Uh, first, as a signal that we will be gathering very shortly in the salle de manger, the dining room. And then it rings second to say, we are at the table and you are expected at the table, particularly uh, my family. And uh, I'm not going to say that my family is always uh, prompt and attentive uh, to that. I remember one of my granddaughters became the more interested in watching the hat hatchings of the Blandons. Uh, those are little chicks, little chickens. And uh, she became so entranced with that that suddenly <laughs> she remembered, oh, I, I believe I just heard the dinner bell the second time. And so she snuck up into her chair at the table. Well, I did not say a thing. Uh, I think she perhaps uh, experienced more of a wonder to express at the dinner table than I might have to have added to it. Uh, I try to attend to dinner uh, promptly. 
And uh, therefore, I keep several books on the mantle uh, in the dining room that I can engage myself in reading before uh, the second dinner bell, at least. And uh, then with the second dinner bell, I may still be standing there reading as many uh, continue to gather at the table. Uh, then uh, after dinner, I enjoy uh, a musicale with my family. I enjoy a family read that can continue into the early evening uh, at a time when we may sup on leftovers after dinner, a, a supper, if you will. And then um, I oftentimes will more or less literally lock myself up in my sanctum sanctorum. If I have not done that in the morning uh, for a length of time that I can complete my daily business, then I will certainly do that uh, early in the evening before I finally retire. I have a suite of rooms and I have a lock there to make certain that I will not be disturbed when I'm in my sanctum sanctorum. That suite of rooms I mentioned earlier uh, is my writing room, the library, of course, and my cabinet uh, right there next to my bed on the opposite side of the dressing room side of my bed. You may know there seems to be a great deal uh, of knowledge about my bedchamber because it's unusual. My bed is in the center of the room in somewhat of a of a partition. You have the dressing room on the one side and you have the cabinet where I often write and read on, on the other side. I retire early, by the way. Uh, Dr. Franklin, of course, was uh, quite perceptive, early to bed, early to rise, uh, keeps a young man uh, healthy. I'm not going to call myself wealthy, but certainly uh, wise. So we have a question from Adam and he would like to know how much time you spend reading each day. Mm. Adam, that is a very good question. I wish I could tally it all up in seconds and minutes and hours, uh, but I would rather tally it in hours because that is truly how long I often spend in reading. And Adam, I have a, um, a most delightful contrivance. Some may refer to it as a music stand. Others call it a book stand. Or you could call it a whirly gig in its own uh, particular uh, uh, opportunity to twirl around, and it, it is. It is Five, four stands that pull out upon which you may place a book or sheet of music, and then it has a, a stand on the top. And so I can read a good five books at the same time, or at least refer to five books if there's a particular subject that I am pursuing. So I can simply rotate that uh, revolving book stand uh, around as I am referring, and that can take hours. In, in my studies and my referrals and reference. So uh, I wish I could say hours entirely. Uh, I remember when I was a young student at the Old Royal College of William & Mary, it is said that I would study for eight hours at a time. Uh, I also tried to spend enough hours of practicing the, the violin. At times I'd spend four hours uh, in my youth practicing the violin. Oh, I was often uh, known to tear myself away from the company of my friends and fellow students in order to revert right back to my chambers, again in the garret of the old uh, uh, hall at William & Mary uh, to attend more directly to my studies. So there you are. In my youth, I can safely say eight hours uh, in my studies and, uh, and a read. Well, we also have a question from Bridget. She'd like to know if you ever miss your time in school. Bridget, that is a wonderful question. Yes, of course I do. I had the most wonderful experience when I was a young boy provided me by my parents. That is the opportunity to go to school. Uh, I believe from my youth having such an opportunity, it ought to be a birthright of every individual, let alone here in our nation. I spent the most delightful uh, school days. Uh, I know that there have been some uh, books that have been written, uh, in particular England, Tom Brown's School Days, uh, to recount, if you will, his early experiences in the cultivation of his mind, an open mind. And I was fortunate having the opportunity of uh, schooling in my youth to have teachers who were conducive to, to provoke the mind, to, to uh, engage profound thought and open the mind even more. And the friends that you make in your youth, particularly at school, so many remain friends throughout your entire life. To think that you were all going through these experiences at the same time, could share uh, your feelings and your thoughts 
both pro and con upon certain subjects. This is where you experience your earliest cultivation, particularly of citizenship. And when I reflect back on those opportunities in school at the Reverend William Douglas School at Tuckahoe, at the Reverend James Morris a Classical Academy here at Castle Hill, and the opportunity I had for two years at the Old World College of William & Mary under the guise of Dr. William Small, I cannot help but think in the midst of all of those teachers, all of the students as well, my good friends, uh, that I was so uh, privileged uh, to have. And many of them continue uh, to be my friends as well. So yes, without a, uh, a question, I often think back on those wonderful days uh, when I was in school. In fact, I will tell you one thing that I'm just remembering here as I referred to the Reverend James Murray's Classical Academy. Uh, there was a man, a lady by the name of Gordon. And uh, I think uh, uh, either her child or a nephew was named William Fitzhugh or Gordon. And uh, I, uh, I had her at supper here and she was reflecting uh, upon where she lived. And suddenly it dawned on me from her description of where she was living uh, up the, the road there towards Castle Hill that she must be living in the very building in which I attended Reverend uh, 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 um, Morris Classical Academy. And I said, I declare, your bedchamber is the room where all of the boys used to reside who attended to Murray's Academy. So there's a pleasant reflection I had the opportunity to share at the meal table. Nearly forgot it. So going back to your days here at Monticello, um, what, is, what is your interaction with Monticello's enslaved laborers like in a given day? Every single day. Every single day. And every single day from the time when I was growing up, as I reflected earlier. Uh, my heavens, there, there could not be uh, the management of Monticello. There could not be the productivity of Monticello. We could hardly survive without uh, all uh, that had been able to provide um, this happiness in my life, those who labor for my happiness. I mentioned that every day I try to ride down Mulberry Row and there in the nailery to engage uh, Peter Fawcett. Uh, or there to talk with Wormley Hughes about the planting in our, our vegetable garden, a good thousand feet long, in which only he is the one knowledgeable to understand what may be producing and what is failing. He knows more than anyone, Wormley Hughes, that I try to plant an abundance, an overabundance, because we know we're going to have a failure, but then we also know we're going to have a success. I engage at the joinery with John Hennings, uh, he has made so many wonderful pieces of furniture that I about say will last long, long after I am gone. And uh, so you cannot help when you're uh, visiting with the overseers to visit with many of those who are laboring in the fields as well, to have a first-hand account of what is being accomplished in those fields. And of course, this is never without the reflection that these, uh, these individuals, um, well, as you know well, do not have a choice uh, in their labors for the most part. So uh, I thank you for asking that question. It's the most valid question, and we have to keep uh, reflecting upon such questions, particularly with respect to our future and the opportunities that everyone may be able uh, to have a say in their livelihood. We have quite a few audience questions, so I'm going to we have a couple of them to you, Mr. Jefferson. Um, Dennis asks, how often do you work in your vegetable garden? <laughs> Dennis, were it left to me to decide how I could spend the short time that is provided to me by our maker on this globe. It would be upon a small patch of ground, uh, well watered, uh, in the cultivation of the soil, surrounded by my family and my books, and in the gentle uh, pursuit of science. But none of us is allowed exactly what we would prefer to do throughout our entire lives. We have duties and obligations. As Rousseau wants to state, man is a social creature, and when we enter into society, we are obligated uh, to our fellow man to fulfill uh, the safety, protection, the face, the uh, defense and the enlightenment of that society. 
So I try to be in my garden as often as I possibly can be. It is not as often as I would desire. I made mention that I try to take daily rides uh, along Mulberry Row, along the vegetable garden, and, uh, and make an inspection. Do I, I putter, so to speak, uh, in that soil? Uh, yes, on occasions I certainly do. Uh, do I plant? Uh, I do. I would presume I plant perhaps more flowers than I am prone to plant uh, vegetables. But yes, I do. I, I find it a great pleasure to be in the garden and partake of that. Uh, and again, I would hope more often than I have uh, in my past. Because I've discovered that the older I become, <laughs> I remain but a young gardener. Nature never fails to reveal further of her wonders the older we become. Denise asks, or she has a statement and then a question. It is reported that George Washington had issues with his feet and Dr. Franklin had poor eyesight. So generally, how is your health? Denise, uh, without uh, any disrespect by way of a correction, uh, I believe it was Dr. Franklin, I recall, having problems with his feet. Uh, he suffered from gout. I know that distinctly. And it was General Washington who um, had increasingly bad eyesight. Uh, I'll never forget when he had to take out his glasses uh, in order to read uh, his... Um, uh, well, his neglect of his commission as general, when he gave up his commission, he said, not only have I grown weary after the war, but I've grown nearly blind. So what ailments do I have? <sighs> rheumatiz. I suffer from the rheumatiz. It seems the older I become, I, I just have more aches and pains. And this is one of the reasons why I've adopted a philosophy uh, in my medical attentions to fight fire with fire. I'm never a day out of the cell. So that is my most pleasant uh, exercise. Now, it was recommended to me that I might be able to soothe uh, my rheumatism. Others I hear refer to it as arthritis. If I were to venture westward to Bath County and take advantage of the, the baths, that is the, the thermal baths, the, the many sulfur springs in Bath County, that's uh, there beyond the eastern ranges of the Blue Ridge and the Shenandoah. So uh, I did make a venture there. I, I spent, uh, it was nearly two weeks at, at a place known, um, I cannot remember the proprietor's name, but it's become more generally known as the homestead. Uh, and they had pools there in which you uh, submerge yourself uh, to your, your head and you, you sit in that uh, for a lengthy period of time. The natives used to do this. The natives did it for generations, if not centuries before the Europeans came. And, and the natives were uh, very helpful in introducing these remedies to anything that may ail you, uh, to our ancestors. So here's what I thought might prove an enemy, uh, a, a remedy uh, for my, uh, my arthritis, my rheumatism. Well, after two weeks, I discovered that I simply, um, it left me with nothing more than boils and a sense of ennui. It, it simply was of no remedy whatsoever to the rheumatism, and that continues on. Uh, there are times when I suffer from indigestion. Um, I have sometimes acute uh, pains in my abdomen. I have been corresponding with Dr. Rush in Philadelphia to seek out uh, something that can help me with that. I endeavor frequently throughout my uh, life to, to doctor myself, to be my own doctor in that effort. So uh, I'm a great promoter of the improvement uh, in medicine. I have concerns about doctors uh, as to whether they're properly schooled and, uh, and continually knowledgeable about the latest advance in medical science. Uh, but um, what I've just summed up more or less as my own ailments is, uh, is what I find at present. We've also had a couple of people comment um, on the upcoming July 4th celebration. So Barbara says, hello, Mr. Jefferson. I'm asking on behalf of my grandson, Bodie Jones, how will you be celebrating the 4th of July at Monticello? Well, Barbara and Bodie Jones, what a pleasure to hear you bring up that day that I hope we never, ever forget, though I must lament, <laughs> John Adams would tell you, it is the 2nd of July that we should remember every year. Uh, he states uh, we should remember that with masked bands, bonfires, parades, and illumination. 
The reason he says the second is because truly that was the day that the Continental Congress voted for independency. That is when they became the new Congress of these states united. Then we had to argue and debate for two days how we wanted the rest of the world to understand what we had done, uh, particularly on behalf of improving the condition of the family of man. So that resulted with the vote on behalf of our Declaration of American Independence achieved on the 4th of July. And oftentimes on the 4th of July, since I've now been home after 40 years in public service, uh, many of my friends and neighbors uh, will come a visiting up here on the West Lawn at Monticello and require me to come out and share with them a toast, uh, if you will, to, uh, to our nation and its continuance. Uh, and very shortly, the witnessing, if you will, of the 50th anniversary uh, of the 4th of July and its vote. So I look forward to greeting people. And uh, if not here at Al Monticello, certainly at Poplar Forest, my retreat house down in Bedford County, uh, I look forward to reading passages or perhaps read the entire declaration of our American independence. So that's how I will endeavor to, uh, to bear witness to the anniversary of our achievements on the 4th of July, 1776. So we certainly hope you will be with us uh, and attend. So we have an interesting question from Mary. It begins with a comment as well, um, or a question. With all the serious work being done, did you have a best friend or anyone to have some fun with? And what did you do for fun? And not only that, do you have a sense of humor and like to laugh? Tell us a funny experience. Well, Mary, you've just caught me laughing how many times as we've been together here in this conversation. And, and I hope that there has been some vestige of humor that I've expressed uh, with you all. I would hate to engage any day without, uh, without humor or humorous outlook upon things. Uh, thank heaven that this has always been a mainstay of man's happiness from time immemorial. One of the reasons I enjoyed to read Plautus, good heavens, what a relief he was uh, during the arguments and contests in ancient Rome that, uh, that he could satirize uh, political economy as it was argued and debated then. Where would we be without Dr. Franklin and his wonderful sense of humor in our own times and many others that can help us like Shakespeare did? And lift up a mirror in which we may see ourselves, our faults, and our fallacies. So, yes, I, I hope that I may maintain a, a sense of humor uh, throughout the years. Uh, now, um, you, you, what was the first part of your question? I keep thinking of the second because I worry if I were never to have a sense of humor. What was the first part? She had asked about Mary. friends. Uh, oh, my best friend. Your best friend. Well, <laughs> with whom do I share? Uh, outbursts of humor, I can tell you that I can go down any day to Charlottesville there and enter into the Swan Tavern. And uh, Mr. Jewett, Jack Jewett, uh, whose son happily warned us of the advance of the British here uh, back, uh, that, was, uh, that was June of 1781, to enjoy his stories of those he meets every single day. Uh, the grocer in Charlottesville I enjoy to meet with. When I go down to Poplar Forest, I enjoy meeting with the Reverend Dr. Charles Clay. Yes, a clergyman with a great sense of humor remains my good friend. Uh, whenever the Madisons come to visit here, uh, when they take that drive a good 40 miles from Montpelier, it takes them an entire day, they know that there is a, a vast table of victuals prepared for them to enjoy at mealtime and they also know there's a very safe and comfortable accommodation in their own room. Now, can you imagine in whose other company could you have a better time than in the company of James Madison and his delightful lady, Dolly? She makes everyone feel at home. She has an infectious sense of humor. And yes, I consider them still amongst my best friends. From my youth, I remember Daphne Carr. When Daphne and I were boys, we were the best of friends and would spend many, many days up here upon our, our little mountain. Uh, and as you know, we made a pact that the first who would die would be buried by the survivor underneath a big oak tree on the west side of the mountain. He married my sister. I could not have been happier with that union. And yet, at only 30 years of age, he shed his mortal coil, the first to be buried in what continues as our family cemetery. I think on Dr. Franklin, what a good friend he was. But even in my college days, 
when I was at the Old Road College in William & Mary, some of my good friends who had attended the Reverend Morris Classical Academy were still my classmates. Willie Fleming, Johnny Page, these were amongst my earliest friends. And then there was Sookie Potter. Oh, was she not a delight. And, uh, and Betsy Burrell, I will not speak of her too lengthily. Uh, uh, I was quite attracted to her at a young age when she turned me down in a marriage proposal, turned around and married, uh, married Mr. Uh, what was his name? He lived on Jamestown Island. Uh, there in the old uh, house upon Ambler, Ambler, Jacqueline Ambler. Thank heaven I nearly forgot his name entirely. But these were all friends in my youth. I cannot avoid that and, and help but be reminded of uh, those delightful friendships from those, those early days. The Marquis de Lafayette, General the Marquis de Lafayette remains a delightful friend. I'm welcoming his return very shortly. Uh, he will be bringing his son, George Washington Lafayette, and they intend to travel throughout all uh, of our 24 states that we have right now. Uh, so I look forward when they visit us here uh, at Monticello. Perhaps we might have a, a conversation in the future to speak extensively upon that ancient friendship that I have enjoyed with the uh, General the Marquis de Lafayette. You recall he was here not long ago and we had the opportunity to speak one with the other. Maybe we can welcome that uh, when he returns. So I know there may be those that I am leaving out here, my good and fast friends. You know, it is an ancient Persian uh, philosophy that if uh, at the time you are ready to shed your mortal coil and enter into the world beyond, that you can count uh, on one hand the close friends that you have had during your entire life, that you are a wealthy individual. Well, it sounds like we could just have a whole conversation about your friends, Mr. Jefferson. Thank you for sharing. Um, we're going to have to wrap up. We've got one final question here and leave it for any comments that you might want to, to tell our audience. But what recommendations do you have for others in developing a sound daily regimen? A sound daily regimen. What is the recommendation? To think that you all showed your respect and your congeniality and friendship by arriving here at the appointed hour, uh, that is one of the clock here uh, this afternoon, uh, is one of the regiments that I think so very, very important in our daily lives, punctuality. I believe it was uh, King Louis the 13th of France who, who said uh, punctuality uh, is the politeness of kings. And that, um, that indeed politeness and good manners are what every gentle person uh, should practice. Do you know, I, I think that's so important because a king does not have to arrive on time, now do they? No, people wait on them and wait for them. So I think a daily regimen can be established uh, first and foremost by the respect for others, uh, that we will arrive on time, attend to our daily duties, in a timely fashion, whatever that may be, arriving at the breakfast table, at the dinner table, uh, times that we appoint distinctly with our families. That's so very, very important beginning at a young age. A time for yourself, that cannot be neglected. As I have traveled worldwide, no matter where I have traveled, no matter in which city I have resided, I have always sought out a hermitage a place where I can simply get away from the cares of the world and be with myself to think or simply to write or to read. And so I think this is important in our daily lives and in our daily regimens. And never ever to neglect whatever our regimen may be, to keep our minds open as to what may befall us tomorrow. Is that what not what education helps us to better understand, to be prepared, because then it is much the easier, is it not, to enter tomorrow through the regiments that have prepared us in kind for many, many days and years. So thank you for being with us once again. I look forward to when we meet uh, in the future. And uh, never forget, <laughs> here at Al Monticello, I remain your humble and obedient servant. 
Thomas Jefferson. Godspeed.